not for children, this is for the adults. If you've got an advent wreath at home, then you could light one of those candles as you as as we go through the service. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for the gift that you give us, the gift of hope and life, of peace and joy and love. We thank you that we can look forward to Christmas Day, the day in which we remember how you, Jesus, are incarnated to live amongst us, that the world is not without hope, that there is goodness that is somewhere deep inside that can come out into the world, and that we can witness your good news in the cradle in a manger. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that you had come to us as we worship you this morning, that we would be filled with an awareness of your presence, of your love for us here as we worship. Amen. So the first hymn, A Candle is Burning, A Flame Warm and Bright. I'm going to try, I'll try and play it and sing it because I have a recording of this one. So if it were safe to do so, we'd be lighting that candle and remembering that candle of hope in the darkness of life. Let us pray. Loving God, we pray that you would help us to have hope in these difficult times. We think of the prophet Isaiah who, who cries out, Lord, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. And at a time like this, when everything seems uncertain and we are confused by the world around us, we echo Isaiah's frustration. And we long for you to tear open the heavens, to come down, to be present to us. As Isaiah continues to pray, he asks that you'd make the mountains tremble, that you'd set the waters to boil. But he also continues to pray that we'd be like clay in the potter's hands. And so when we lose hope, we ask that you would mold us and renew us and help to renew our hope so that we would have hope again. When we feel like crying, Lord, open the heavens and come down, help us to remember that you have come down to be amongst us in the person of Jesus. That through Jesus we know that we are never alone, but that you are always with us and that you keep us. Lord, you've taught us also to follow you more closely. And so we ask that you would help us to follow you in the way that you have led, to not be blown about by the winds of the world, 
but to be guided only by your love and your presence. And so we confess our lack of faith, our lack of hope, our lack of joy and peace and love. And we ask, O Lord, that you would be born in us this Advent and Christmas season, that you would renew our hope, peace, joy and love, even against the ugliness of the time, even against the stress of our present moment. And so we confess our lack. And we trust you, O God, to supply all our wants and our needs. And as we confess, we hear your words of mercy spoken to each and every one of us. As you say, my child, your sins are forgiven. And as we look up to you, you reach out your hand to us, you lift us up, and you say, go and sin no more. And Lord, we can know that to go and sin no more is possible because your Holy Spirit is poured out into our hearts to give us life and strength. We can walk in your presence and your way. We pray together as Jesus has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, it's an awkward moment where I've got another hymn, but again, I don't have my guitar. I'm going to try and sing it, and uh, block your ears if it just goes paw shaped otherwise join with it in prayer my hope is built on nothing less than jesus blood and righteousness i dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in jesus name christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm he is Lord Lord of all when darkness seems to hide his face I rest on His unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil Christ alone Cornerstone Weak made strong In the Savior's love Through the storm he is Lord, Lord of all. Through the storm, hey, and the wind blows and everything. When he shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in him be found, Dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Yes, Lord, when the storms rise up around us, when life seems so chaotic, we ask that you would give us your peace and your strength, that you alone would be our true cornerstone. Amen. We've actually done really well as far as the wind goes the last few weeks of, uh, of services. And I know that every time we've tried to have the carol service outside, we've been blown inside. So just remember, if you're skinny, to bring lots of rocks in your pockets. But most of us Methodists are a little bit, uh, we're safe from the wind. And that's, that's why I eat so much, is so that I don't get blown away by the wind. It's an important thing to do in Cape Town. 
We've got some beautiful scriptures today for this uh, Sunday service uh, from Isaiah chapter 64, verse 1 to 9. And uh, I'll refer to that during the sermon. And then uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, but that's on your sheets or in your emails. And then the gospel reading from uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 24 to 37. So I'll start by reading from Mark chapter 13, verse 24. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. But I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And from Isaiah chapter 64, from verse 1 to 9. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry. I think my sound just went away, hey? Do not be angry beyond measure. Do not... This is a curious situation. (laughs) Line in. Hello. Hello. Hello? 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 There it is again. Just went soft. Can you still hear me? Okay. A little bit. Wave your hand if you can hear me. Okay. So you can hear me just a little bit. From 
my side it's as loud as it will go and I'm worried that the people on the Facebook are going to hear it's going to go strange sorry if you're listening on Facebook and you can't hear me but this doesn't help okay Lord help us with all these technical issues to work out your purpose so that everyone would hear and that we would be able to share your message with the world around us. Amen. So for Advent, there's uh, four Sundays during Advent, and the first of those Sundays is one that's about hope, the next is joy, the following is peace, the following is love. And so during Advent, I'm going to be talking about Jesus, our source of hope, peace, joy, and love. And as I do that, I'm just trying to test the... Facebook feed to see if they can hear me there. Oh, they can hear me nicely. Good. Okay, they can hear me. You can sort of hear me. We carry on. So we reflect on those four themes and I sound like a chipmunk. I don't know how to take that, Mike. <laughs> I can't fix it right now. I don't know what went wrong here. There we go. I discovered the problem. Do I sound like a chipmunk still, Mike? Okay, good. Well, what I was going to say was that... Why do you say I sound like a chipmunk? <laughs> Sorry for our Facebook watches. Okay. I was reading um, that um, passage from Isaiah last night. Um, Tear open the heavens and come down. And I feel so irritated and grumpy with the way things are right now. You know, I'm tired of not going to church and, and having a service with lots of singing and songs and all our friends and all our people. I'm, I'm tired of hearing about politicians taking COVID relief money and doing nonsense with it. I'm tired of people not being accountable for all the actions. I'm, I'm tired of nonsense. And, and, and I feel so hopeless. And I want to preach about hope, but I'm thinking about this beautiful celebration that we're having today where we're collaring ministers for, for ministry, but we can only have a few people at the service and everything is just squashed down and ugly. When you go to spa and you just see everyone with their masks on, it just feels like you're in some sort of science fiction movie that's just a nightmare. And I felt like doing what Isaiah does in Isaiah chapter 64. When he says, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. And we are supposed to be people who live with hope. And I, I would say that even though I was feeling a bit hopeless, I know I had that little candle that can't be snuffed out of hope because I trust in God. And that trusting in God means, means more than just believing that God will one day save me or something like that, like it's something that I that is an out-of-body thing, but rather it's the hope that God is at work in the world and God will bring his purposes about in the world. And as we begin our Advent journey, this is the beginning of our Christian year, we got to the end of the year last week and we had Christ the King Sunday and we spoke about judgment and justice, now we should look forward to that. Now at Advent we start to reflect on the, the virtues of Christian life. The things that we should embody as people that we should be known for as this community here in the world. People would say about us, when we meet these people from church, from any church, we meet, we find hope, we find peace, we find joy, and we find love. Should we embody those things? But now as we look forward to Jesus being born, we remember that Jesus is the source of our hope, of our joy, of our peace, and our love. The first thing that we need to remember is that hope, 
joy, peace and love are based in the goodness of God. They are dependent on God's goodness. They are the, the first nature of life as it ought to be. They are virtues that describe goodness. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 31, when God saw all that he had made, it was very good. It was very good. And so we become overwhelmed by, by the evil of the times. We become overwhelmed by the corruption of human nature. We become overwhelmed by disasters and brokenness. But Augustine reminds us that if all that is created is actually good, then evil is never permanent. Evil is always and only temporary. In one of the commentaries that I was reading as I prepared, as I was thinking about Genesis 1 verse 31 and, and finding hope in the world that we live in, one of the commentators said, sin is a later intrusion into an originally good creation. It is not inherent in the world. And so it can be completely removed when God achieves his purposes in the consummation. That's the, 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 the foundation for, for these four virtues of hope, joy, peace, and love that are at the core of the created order, that are at the core of our human identity. We are not primarily evil. The world is not primarily evil. The world at its core has goodness, love, joy, and peace in it. And so as we are overwhelmed perhaps by cancer, by disease, by poverty, by retrenchment, by the struggles that we face in life, by, by pain and suffering and all of those things, we need to remember that these things are not the last word, but God's hope, peace, love, and joy are. So if we think about hope, maybe we think that the opposite of hope would be despair. But I think that perhaps the opposite of hope is surrender. Not surrendering to the will and purpose of God, but instead surrendering to the wind and the waves of the world. Just not, not continuing to fight for that which is good. So to me, perhaps the opposite of hope is giving up. Getting to the point where we say, I know what we should do, but this is just the way the world is. And then we just put up with the status quo. We don't try to change things. We don't even try to change ourselves. We see no better way of life. Paul writes to the Ephesians of, of them before they knew Jesus. He said, you had no hope and you were without God in the world. As Isaiah writes in Isaiah 64, he's writing at a time when Israel has been taken into exile in Babylon. And a generation after being in exile in Babylon, people are getting comfortable with being part of the Babylonian empire. And this is how the Babylonians bent people to their will. At the beginning of the exile, they took the leading people and they took them to the Babylonian universities and they sponsored them with an education there. And then these influences would come back and lead the people in a Babylonian way. As we read the scriptures, we hear of people like Daniel who went along and learned, but instead of being influenced, he, he influenced them in, in the way of God. He stood up to their corruption and stood up for what was good. But we easily fall asleep under the Babylonian ways. And a prophet like Isaiah is there to wake us up, there to shout through our dreamlike existence and call out to God, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. We're asking for connection. We're asking for God to come and, and be part of our lives, to reach out to us, to touch us, we're crying out so loudly that we're saying, just shake that table mountain. Let us discover that it's a volcano. We're tired of these mini earthquakes. We want a big one. We want to feel it. We're tired of little fires. We want big fires where twigs burst into flame. We're asking for God's presence, deeply felt and truly felt. 
prophet laments, tear open the heavens and come down, get here and sort us out. He laments our lack of hope and our lack of faith, the way that we just go with the status quo. In verse 6 of Isaiah 64, we shrivel up like a leaf, but like the wind, our sins sweep us away. We give up. We think that our sin is stronger than us, so we let it just sweep us away like a dried up leaf. He laments, no one calls on your name. Instead of drying up, we should call out to God and say, give us life, help us against the sin, or strive to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. It's as if God has looked away because God doesn't want to embarrass us by looking at us as we continue to do things in a worldly way describes us in our hopelessness, just like leaves blown in the wind going the way that the world goes without ever resisting what's happening. Eugene Peterson in the message says, no one prays to you, makes the effort to reach out to you. But the prophet, like all good prophets, doesn't give up there. He doesn't give up in hopelessness. In verse 8 he says, yet, O Lord, you are our Father. It's more than just saying, oh, you would care about us because you are our Father. It is saying that, that we are created in your image. We were meant to be like you, but we've become like leaves that are blown around in the wind. We don't have the gravity that we need. He reminds us of how we are created. In the story of Genesis, that God took clay. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hands calling out to God to mold us and make us the way that we ought to be instead of the way that we've become. Look at us, we pray, for we are all your people. From dried up leaves blowing in the wind like the leaves around here, to lumps of clay with weight and strength and heaviness that God has taken and molded to be something. Turning from hopelessness, surrender, to hope, putting our shoulders in and, and striving against the brokenness of the world. As we remember that Jesus is the source of our hope, we hear a passage that sounds pretty hopeless. Mark 13, 24. In those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven the powers in the heavens will be shaken. That sounds terrifying and hopeless. But if we listen to the words of Mark and we realize that Mark's gospel was really written down, so the oral tradition of Jesus would have been passed around. People didn't write things, they memorized things in those days. Only a generation or so later, people started writing it down so that it wouldn't be corrupted for further generations. But at the time that this is written down, just before 74 AD, or 79 AD, I'm getting confused, when Vesuvius would erupt. The eruption of Vesuvius would, would cause such a dust and smoke cloud that in a world that was normally unpolluted, suddenly the stars would disappear because of this pollution that had swept into the air. Suddenly the moon would become dull because of of, of the smoke in the air. In 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple, the giant temple that Herod had built, would be torn down after a siege. You know how when the mountains on fire, the, the moon goes red. And that's why they said that, that Mars has had that, that red tinge to him, that Mars was the god of war. They said that there was blood on the moon because when there was war, there was fire, and when there was fire, the smoke would go into the sky. And at night when you couldn't see the fire, you'd see that the moon was red, and you'd say that Mars is in charge at the moment. These signs of the, of the stars disappearing and the sun not shining as bright as it does and the, and the moon not shining are, are signs of, of conflict and brokenness going on in the world at the time at which the scripture is written down and repeated to people. And stand as a sign to us forever in times of distress and brokenness that God does not give up on us. 
But in the middle of this language about destruction and brokenness, Jesus, I imagine him pointing to a fig tree. Maybe if it's winter, the fig trees are empty. They look dead. And I keep telling you about my amazing, miraculous grapevine. It turns to nothing, and I think, oh, no, I've killed it. And now it's just pouring out bunches of grapes, and I hope that they're sweet this year. And if it's sunny enough and good enough, I'll have lovely, sweet honeyfoot grapes. And I might even share one or two with, with you. Maybe. Only if they're not very nice. I mean, only if they're very nice. In the middle of this language about destruction and hopelessness, Jesus says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. We're so used to hearing these words as words of doom and gloom from the hellfire and brimstone preacher. But remember that the people are listening to this, are longing for Jesus' reign. They're longing for Jesus' justice to come. This is a message of hope, and we should be longing for this reign of God, this justice to come. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. The fig tree is starting to blossom. There's new fruit on the vine. Something is happening. God is at work. The sign of life against death is perhaps the resurrection of Jesus. This tiny little sprout of life against the reigning terror of death. So when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. This is good news, not bad news. In our times of trial and distress, God is closer than we think. God is closer than we ever thought before. In those days when the, the sun grew dim and the moon dulled and the stars disappeared from the sky, it felt like the world was falling apart. We experienced a shaking of the foundations. We thought everything was secure, and we find that everything that we thought was secure wasn't. Our pension isn't what it was going to be. Our job isn't what it was going to be. Our diet isn't what it was going to be. There is this glimmer of hope. After a few weeks of spring every year, I notice in my mind that there's suddenly a bush of leaves. There's giant bunches of grapes. There's doves making nests. The whole shebang because God is always up to something. Again from Isaiah we read this prophecy. This prophecy about the shoot. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. We see that this light, this glimmer of goodness, that will eventually overwhelm the darkness of the moment, is greater than anything. We didn't read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, but I invite you to do that. But as Paul writes to the Corinthians, he reminds them and he reminds you, you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sorry, those on Facebook, you're getting blown away here. It's a Facebook audience should eat a bit more so that they wave it. God is saying to us, you've got this. You have the spiritual gifts that you need for this moment. You've got what it takes. And as he goes on, he reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 to 9, He will strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God will not give up on you. God has not given up on you. God will never give up on you. So we remember that Jesus is our source of hope. That 
through Jesus we can know that creation is good. We read in John chapter 1 verse 3, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. At the core of everything is the goodness of God. Evil cannot exist in the way that goodness exists. Evil is incidental. God's goodness is eternal. Isaiah warns us not to become like dry leaves blown about in the wind, just giving up on ourselves and giving up on the world. He cries out, God, come down. He reminds us that God is our Father, that we are like clay and He is the potter. We can be renewed and restored. God can carry on working in us. And finally, in Jesus, we're reminded of that fresh shoot of hope. A new, a new stem, a new beginning. In the first Corinthians, we're reminded that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift. You have the spiritual and personal resources that you need for this moment. So we can hope. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, be our source of hope against the darkness of the world we live in. Give us strength to face each and every challenge that comes up. Give us hope against confusion. Hope against surrender. As we surrender not to the ways of the world and the winds of the world, but to your molding hands as you transform us and renew us and you help us to become more like you. So we pray for your hand of blessing upon the world we live in. We pray for signs of hope to spring up all over the place. And Lord, today as our circuit celebrates the coloring of, of Ian Ace, Linda Matuta and Nombeliso Kaba, we ask that each of them would be a, a spring of hope for the world in which they will minister. Lord, as we go out today, help us to bear fruit for you good and sweet fruits of love and joy and peace and kindness as we share your love with all the world. Amen. I'm not going to try and sing the last hymn, Acapulco, because I have outshouted myself against the wind and I'm trying to hold everything down before it gets blown away. So I'm going to invite us to, oh, I better sing to you, otherwise we won't take an offering. So we sing our, our final hymn, What a Faithful God, and I'm going to croak through it for you. Lord, I come before your throne now, grace. I find rest in your presence and fullness of joy. In worship and wonder, I behold your face, singing, What a Faithful God have I. What a faith! Look, I'll skip the chorus. Lord of mercy, you have heard my cry. Through the storm, you're the beacon, my song in the night. In the shelter of your wings, hear my heart's reply, singing, What a faithful God have I. Lord, all sovereign, granting peace from heaven, let me comfort those who suffer with the comfort you have given. I will tell of your great love for as long as I live, singing, What a faithful God have I. What a, what, what a, I won't sing the What a faithful God have I. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us together here at uh, Table B Methodist and thank you for joining in Facebook, on the radio and uh, the parking lot and uh, as we journey through Advent we meet again next Sunday and uh, also the Saturday before that there is going to be a Borobos roll sale. Please uh, find the office so that you can order those Borobos rolls and they'll also be uh, hampers of baked goods for sale, Christmas goods, etc. So even though you might be celebrating Christmas 
uh, at home with your small family this season, you can uh, you can share some some delicious snacks. And so, as we come to a close, we say the grace to one another. Let's uh, say it. Pray together as we say, and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. And Lord, as we stand in God from this place, we also dedicate our offering to you. Take our money, we pray, and use it to build your kingdom in this place. But more important, take our lives and use us as your hands and feet. In Jesus' name. Amen.